Hill Public Image Limited. Uh, starting the show, or Steve Vinyl show, and as I said, a special guest tonight, uh, I've got uh, Brian Paul from Renardo and the Low. Uh, good evening, Brian. Ah, oh, greetings, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming in. Oh, you're more than welcome. And obviously you came in earlier this year because uh, we had yourself um, and uh, Pete Coots mm-hmm. and uh, it was a third person, wasn't it? Uh, Rob. Rob uh, came in to talk about South Specific, which was the 1980 uh, Portsmouth compilation album. Yeah. And uh, the reason you're back in is, A, because that was the first time I met you and obviously I'd heard Renardo and The Loaf that was, uh, you had a couple of tracks on that album, didn't you? We had some tracks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, also the fact that, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be a South Pacific 2 this year, So, and obviously you're being involved in that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I've been involved since the beginning of the idea, yeah. and um, we're, as a band that still exists from the, the first South Pacific... You're the only band, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, that uh, we're going to be on it, um, doing a 2020 track or yep, two, yep. Um, which we're working on at the moment. Brilliant, brilliant. And obviously we can't go any further than mentioning the other half of the duo. Who is? That's uh, David Jansen, my and best friend. And uh, oh, this, this is 50 years, actually, this year that we've known each other. So you met in 1970? Yep. Wow, OK. And uh, where is uh, where is David? Uh, David lives in Mid Wales. Right. Um, he may be listening in now, I don't know, but if he Good is... Good evening, uh, David. Yeah, uh, greetings, Dave. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's uh, got a nice, nice place in the middle of Wales, in the middle of the country. And do you go there often? I mean, do you, do you record... I mean, where do you record now? Uh, well, I, I tend to go about twice a year. OK. Um, we talk every week. Right. Uh, but uh, we tend to record um, in our own studios. Right. And then swap files. Oh, OK. That's the way it happens now, so... Uh, so it's all done uh, on the internet? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in the old days, what did you used to do then? In the old days, mm. um, when, when we were uh, recording... Before the internet. Before, before the internet, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> before there were computers, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah um, well, OK, in, in, in the old days, we... Um, uh, well, we only ever did the music we did for our own pleasure. Yes. I mean, and uh, we, I would go around on a Tuesday evening, and I would go around on a Saturday afternoon and evening to, to Dave's house. Sorry, so Dave actually lived in Portsmouth Oh, Dave, Dave's, yeah, Dave's a, a Portsmouth guy. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, OK, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah, I didn't so realise We were at school that. together. Ah, uh, That's okay. where we met up, uh, right. in the art room. OK. And uh, so... We became friends because we shared uh, a liking of the band Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, and just Mr. Mr. Mate. Mark Bolan, yeah, y- yeah, yeah. That's, mm. that's that's his band, mm. but not T Rex. No, I stress Tyrannosaurus Rex. Before they were called, before they went electric, is that correct? Yeah, before they went glam. Mm. Uh, and uh, basically, that's why we remained a duo because we were just into that band. We thought we'll have two people can make music like that. Mm. We'll stay just as two people. So we never, ever aspired to be like a, what you might call a conventional band structure or yeah, anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, t- mm. so it was t- Tyrannosaurus Rex that inspired you, yeah. which is quite interesting for me because when I listen to Tyrannosaurus Rex and listen to you, mm. I hear two different things. Right. Musically. Well, fine, that's perhaps how it should be. Uh, OK, OK. Um, because... Basically, I mean, we sort of started off, we, I mean, we, we learned to play guitars or sort of unplay guitars um, at the, the same time and influenced by Tyrannosaurus Rex. And so we did this bunch of recordings in the early 70s mm. that would have been sort of like poor imitations of Tyrannosaurus Rex. OK. Um, but that developed up a way of playing and then eventually later on, which we'll no doubt talk about... Mm. Um, uh, things changed. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the stuff we're doing now, yeah, you basically probably find it very difficult to sort of see any parallels, mm. but uh, it's in the DNA somewhere. OK, brilliant, brilliant. Because I know a band that you that you loved and were inspired by was, was The Residents from USA, is that correct? That's right, yeah. yeah. But obviously they were late, they weren't going, when were they going, The Residents? Oh, The Residents um, uh, have been recorded since 1972. Oh, OK. And so, but their, their, um, their records only became generally available on import to, to the UK probably around about 76. OK. 
Okay. Um, and we encountered them in uh, 77. Because you actually met them, didn't you? Uh, eventually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm. okay. I mean, that's a great part of the story, so we'll leave that, <laughs> we'll leave that as we continue. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, how did you actually fall? In? Okay, so you met at school. Right. Um, and from there, you, you had a common interest, obviously, in tra- Tyrannosaurus Rex, and yep. that's what you wanted to do. Yep. Um, and Renardo and the Loath, the name of the band. Oh, that's it, a lot, lot later. Oh, that, okay. That, that, that's in, like, what you might call the second phase of what we, we did. So what were you a, called in the first phase? We weren't called you... anything. Oh, okay. We didn't have, because, <laughs> you didn't have a because name. We, there was no need to have a public persona because oh, okay. we were recording just for ourselves, and that was that. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, basically developing up how... Well, I don't know, it's the sort of vocabulary of how we might sort of, you know, make music at some time and yeah. work, you know, playing with techniques and things like that. Yeah, so you were just, like, experimenting in that period? Yeah, well, we desperately wanted to sort of make music that perhaps sounded um, uh, listenable. I mean, yes. it was. It yeah. was. It wasn't unlistenable. I think, actually, to tell the truth, we did do a couple of um, uh, little gigs at uh, the local uh, youth club. Right. Um, uh, in that first phase. That's at the um, school youth club, yeah? Uh, wasn't the school. I th- oh, right. I think it was um, a church youth club. Oh, OK. And, uh, yeah, we, we sort of, you know, sat, sat on the floor and played our music and that was that. But we gradually got more and more experimental, which freaked them out, I think. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we didn't do that anymore. Well, certainly you're a different band. I mean, for those that haven't heard Renard and the Loaf, you're just about to hear them. Obviously, they're on the show all night. Um, they are different, uh, but I like different. Um, you know, um, though it's a punk and new wave show, I like anything that's different. It's not necessarily in that genre. Um, so the first track I've got here, and, and this sums you up, really, it's called... Meaning of weird. Meanings so, of weird. Yeah. Meanings of weird. Yeah. So, uh, where's this from then? Okay. Well, the the residents fan club had a competition for for fans to come up with a, a meaning for weird. W e i r d. Right. Um, we never actually, in the end, put in a an entry, but inspired us to write the lyrics for the song. Okay. Um, which this song was the first track on our um, self released cassette album Ronaldo and the Loaf play Struve and Sneff. <laughs> okay. So that's so what is Les Struve and Sneff? What Struve, is that? Oh God, I, a, I can't, that, I can't even pronounce it. I mean it. that's a story in itself. Um, oh, right, okay. we, which we'll talk about yeah, dice, yeah, yeah. dice names in a minute. Shall okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so you've got the meaning of weird uh, yeah, the meanings uh, of weird yes. W E I R D. Now I yeah. assume there's you, you you've got them with, you know, there's capital letters. so Yeah. Do these mean something? No, the, 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 oh. most of the, 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 the lines of the, the lyric are actually pretty much chosen at random from a dictionary. Oh, OK. Just by pointing at the right letter. Right. And with a little bit of artistic work on it. Oh, um, I see. But I think the winning, winning entry for the residents' uh, fan club was... Um, oh, what is it? Oh, God. We... Oh, gee. Sorry, everyone, I've forgotten it. Matter, um, matter, I'll think matter. about it and I'll have it... Um, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. No, we endorse immediate residence deification. Wow. That's what it was. I'm impressed that you remembered that, actually. Yeah, so I don't I. think I can remember <laughs> that. OK, so let's have a listen to it. It's just the first track, then, by Renato and the Loaf. This is Meanings of Weird. OK, uh, Brian's uh, still in the house, and I hope you are still after Meanings of Weird. That was from uh, 1979, and what's the name of that cassette? Uh, Ronaldo and the Loaf were seeing perhaps what we wouldn't do, and so for have a bit of fun, we used to throw a dice to decide what to do when we went out, like oh. which pub to go to, uh, what to do in the pub, stuff like that. Wow. And <laughs> so we decided to, we'd all have dice names. Right. And the dice names were were given to you by someone else. You generally okay. didn't make your own one up, yeah? Right. And um, so that's where Ronaldo and the Loaf, the name came from. Ah. Uh... So you were Ronaldo? Well, I'm Ronaldo. Dave's Ted the Loaf. Right. Um, Ted the Loaf, it's because at the time Dave had a a bushy beard. Okay. And so with the cassette, we we put it together and it's a bit like Ronaldo and the Loaf playing the music of this other fictitious duo. <laughs> okay, wow, that was an interesting story in itself. So, <laughs> so you've got the cassette. So, how many did you make? 
We made 250. Each one was um, handmade and taken off of uh, the master tape. Oh, so you, you manufactured them yourself? Oh, then. yeah, we you just bought Easter. out loads of blank well what, yeah we C60s did them in, or mm, yeah c60 we did them yeah. in, we did them in batches of 10 okay. i mean we, we sold about 250 over three years i mean so we just mm. started we did it through a local record shop yeah Mardi Gras records in fawcett road at the time right and uh, it was the time when diy music was mm. was really you know happening yeah and just did it okay brilliant and and uh, so how many tracks were on that I don't know. I mean, oh, were there, but I don't know. <laughs> Ten on side one and two on side two, or something like that. Um, I okay. haven't counted them for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you still got a copy? Oh yeah, I've got I've got a couple of the original ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, but it was say. re-released last year um, as a 40th anniversary edition by an American label called Block Global. They, and what they, format uh, was that in? Cassette. Oh, still cassette. Yeah. And oh, okay. They faithfully reproduced the original. Right. And put it in a box and it's got a booklet and stuff like that and numbered, mm. numbered edition mm. and, and stuff. So, yeah, that came out, you know, uh, last September. Oh, but that was great, wasn't it? Oh, it was really nice. Mm. Nice to see it. Nice that it was recognised and, you know, yeah. and, and people could actually get a cassette copy if they wanted to. Yes, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so that, that turned out well. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Okay, okay, uh, so we've got the name. We know where you get the name from, which yeah. is excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a bit of background to the members. Obviously, you joined at school, and, so, and there's no point talking about the lineup because the lineup never changes. It's just you mm -hmm. and David. Yeah. There's, there's no one coming and going. There's no drummers falling out with guitarists. <laughs> it's just you and him. That's right, yeah. I think on a couple of occasions, we, we had sort of friends who came in and just um, jammed, you know, messed around and jammed. Mm. Uh, but um, and we had a, a guy play violin on a track in 1983 who was a, a friend as well. Right. Um, but no, no, it's always been... So Dave these are like guest musicians? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. For want yeah, of a better yeah. word. So yeah. it's you and Dave are the nucleus of the band. You are the band. Yeah. Or yeah. the duo. Yep. Uh, and and that's the way it's always been and that's yeah. the way... It, will be i guess excellent excellent okay uh, the next track we're going to play is called kim bolton gnome song yeah now obviously i'm going to ask is kim bolton a name or a place it's a road in Copno, kim bolton road <laughs> okay you think it, okay <laughs> i thought you would have known that Steve. I, 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 I don't <laughs> anyway um yeah yeah basically the story of this one is that uh, we always used to record around at Dave's house and, and uh, his uh, studio overlooked the uh, the back gardens um, from, from his house. He looked over the back gardens of Kim Bolton Road. Right. And he observed that every winter the man in the, in the garden at the back of his, who had this huge gnome collection in the oh, garden, okay. would take the gnomes indoors during the winter. Right. And so... To keep them warm, obviously. Yeah, and that's mm. what we thought. And yeah. so we wrote the song around this, this guy taking his gnomes indoors. Oh, okay. <laughs> excellent. I love it. I just love the stories. Yeah, OK. So, um, and this is from a, another release called mm -hmm. uh, Swinging Larvae. Is that correct? Yeah, the songs for Swinging Larvae. Songs album, yeah. for Swinging Larvae. So yep. this is obviously a play on Frank Sinatra, isn't it's it? it? Songs for Swinging mm, Lovers. lovers. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, get, I get the connection. <laughs> so, Swinging Larvae? Well, well the, at, the, at the time, um, Dave had a, a, a particular knowledge of um, entomology and uh, about insects and stuff like that, mm. yeah? And um, I, I suppose some, some of the uh, uh, tracks on Larvae had sort of titles and and references to insect stuff. Okay. Um, and the cover is um, actually a, a, a guy and a woman with like caterpillar mandibles um, and things like that. So we just mm. muddled it up, and um, we thought, well, yeah, the title, the title can um, can come from that, and it just did. It's one of these sort of things sitting in the pub, you know. Mm. So one of us sort of said it and just thought it was funny, and it mm. stuck. And this is 1981, isn't it now? This is 81, yeah, by the time that we'd signed a contract with a, an American label called Ralph Records. And, um, you know, it's the cassette release, which you played a track from just now, yep, yep. that um, directly led to getting the contract with Ralph Records. Ralph Records being the, the label um, uh, 
closely associated with the residents. Right, OK. And so we actually signed to the label of a band we thought were sort of like, you know, dead great. I mean, it was amazing for mm, us. Mm, uh, and, mm. um, yeah, and it was just, again, exactly the right label to be on. Yeah, brilliant. So chronologically then, we've got the cassette in 1979. Yeah. Obviously we jumped one because obviously you were on the South Pacific album. Oh, in 1980. Uh, in 1980, yeah. weren't you? So you had a, a yeah. you had an input in that. So yeah. now we're moving on to Songs for Swinging Larvae, 1981. And uh, as I said, this track is from that album and it's called Kim Bolton Gnome Song and we know why now. Yep. So let's have a let's have a listen. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, what do we have? We had Kim Bolton Gnome song uh, before the break. And uh, so we talked about the cassette and you taking it over to America. Now, we glossed over that a bit. Tell me a bit more about that. It's quite important, isn't it, in the story? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty central. Um, so we just finished the cassette and it coincided with um, me going on a, a holiday with a bunch of mates to California. Right. And the uh, the residents, I'd say, a band at... Uh, They're David, based in California, yeah? Uh, in San Francisco, yeah. Did you deliberately go there, Brian, uh, to see them? W w no, well, no, I didn't deliberately choose to go to San Francisco. This was organised ah. by the guys. It was a fly-drive thing. Is this a that. dice thing again? You threw, you threw the been. dice and said, oh, let's go there. <laughs> well, it could have been. But uh, anyway, the dice luckily came up that um, we went to San Francisco yeah. and... Um, uh, basically, I said, oh, okay, right, we're going to be in. I've got to go to Ralph Records, um, which wasn't a shop or anything, it's a um, mail order only. Okay. Uh, to, to check it out, and I wanted to buy some albums. And so I phoned up beforehand and uh, sort of said, hey, is it okay to come round? And they said, yeah. So This is, this is the residents, the members. Well no, well, no one knows who the residents are. You know what I mean? The residents are anonymous. Oh, are they? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know... I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. The residents, um, as as people, nobody knows exactly who they are. Ah. They're like an art collective, as well ah. as music, doing art. So there's no film. photos of them, then, or pictures? Oh, there are lots of photos of the residents, but they always um, wear masks and disguise. Ah, okay. Mm. Okay. 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 And uh, so, uh, basically, I went there and... Um, to drop a cassette in and buy these albums and I handed the cassette over and I said, oh, well, maybe you know, Ralph Records would like to hear it. And this guy took um, the cassette and went into this little area and listened to a few tracks, which was really nice of him to do that while okay. I was there. And he, um, he came out and said, yeah, th th this is really good. And sent us some more stuff, which right. over the next sort of few months um, we did and um, a, a contract came through the post, an offer of a contract. Wow. And uh, anyway, it sort of turned out, I found out afterwards that the, the guy that I'd met was one of the residents. <laughs> and uh, it was right. the residents themselves who sort of put a word in and said, these guys should release something on Ralph Records, which is brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so that cassette was like really important in in... In the getting history. Us to, getting us to move forward, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from that cassette, you got the deal. Got a deal, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, mm. brilliant. And you met one of the residents without even knowing. I didn't know it until much later, no. No, excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent. OK, um, so the next track uh, we've got. So, so moving on then, so we've got the cassette, uh, we've got the South Pacific, uh, we've got Songs for Swinging Larvae, which yep. we've just played a track from. The next album that came out was in 1983, is that yep. correct? Yeah. And it's called Arabic Yodeling. Um, yeah. So tell me about that. Well, this is like the difficult second album, basically, because everything we'd done um, it's previously... It's the third album that's difficult. Well, yeah, but everything we'd done before, right, had been c done in complete innocence. we just recorded for our own fun. OK. Right? No... Not no knowing, pressure. Not, no, no, pressure. no pressure. Not knowing yeah, that yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. available on a record somewhere or whatever. Ah, okay, yeah. And of course, the next one, Ralph. We're, we're with Ralph Records, and they, well, a brilliant label. I mean, they never hassled us to do anything. No. Um, the, we we sort of found um, it difficult. We got so hypercritical of what we were doing that we sort of oh, you know, it just was difficult. It wasn't working properly. So right. we took a bit of a break. And then came back, and um, it worked. And then 
Arabic yodeling came out of that. Okay. Um, so, and it's it's a little bit different. There's some uh, different sort of feel to it. Uh, we we bought a couple of instruments. Um, uh, which influenced what we did. Mm. Uh, we had um, a keyboard for the first time. Um, oh right, okay. Casio two hundred two, if I remember rightly. It just we wanted something that mimicked real instruments as much as possible. Right, and that was what it was for. Okay, and um, and that's what uh, we we used, and it gave a different, to say, a different feel to to from you know, Arabic yodeling from larvae. It was different. Okay, excellent. Let's have a listen then. This is uh, from Arabic Yodeling, came out in 1983, and this uh, track is called Bearded Cats. Hey, uh, Brian, where were we? What were we talking about before we broke? We uh, heard, we heard Bearded, bearded cats, cats, didn't we, yeah. from Arabic Yodeling, the yeah, album, didn't that's we? Right. That's got one of the guest musicians. That, that the, the violin is played by a guy called Dave Baker, okay. who was actually a... a was actually one of the uh, tutors at the Portsmouth Art College at the time and okay. uh, had a good friend. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah, 80, yeah, 83 was interesting in that um, uh, we, we actually ended up rec uh, recording an album with the residents. Right. Uh, in 81, Dave and I went over um, to, to sort of, you know, meet everybody and that. Uh, and uh, while we were there, um, the residents came in and sort of said, oh, what would it be like if we um, all got in the studio at the same time? What would happen? Why? Well, we didn't know. No. And neither did they. So uh, we, we all squeezed into their quite small studio and jammed for a, a period of time and mm -hmm. some interesting sounds came out of it uh, with, and we had this notion well they had the notion of completing an album in four days wow that was impossible so it got shelved and that was that in 83 um, they said oh let's finish it off let's do it let's finish this album off and uh so um it wasn't convenient for dave to go over to san francisco at that time they wanted to do it so i, I went over and spent three weeks in the studio with them um, and we turned the jam session stuff into an album which was called Titan and Limbo. Okay. And uh, I haven't actually included a selection from that because um, uh, I didn't know how much time we'd have. But, okay, uh, that's, fine, but, that's uh, fine. But anyway, it turned out to be a really interesting album. It didn't sound like the residents or us particularly. It was like a clash of them, a clash of, uh, 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 you know, the two bands. Mm. And... Um, uh, but it did us good. I mean, the, our half of the royalties bought us an eight-track studio. Wow. So you got some money from that. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. 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 Mm. Okay. The next track we're going to play is uh, Critical Dance. Now, that is also from uh, an um, album called The Elbow Is Taboo. That's right. Yeah. So that's 1987. Yeah. Yeah. It's in a four-year gap. Um, because in that intervening period, we we got um, introduced to Steve-O at some bazaar who wanted to release our next album, and so things were done in a very different way to what we'd done before. Okay. Uh, and um, we had, a, you know, also a compilation we put together for Rough Trade, uh, which um, took a bit of time out as well. So you were still doing stuff even though there was a gap? We, we were doing stuff but things were interrupting it a lot and that's, <laughs> okay. and that's why uh, and also there were other changes I mean the studio moved from Dave's place into my flat um, which changed the, the, the working mechanism especially for Dave I mean I think it was uh, different for him because he didn't have the machines uh, you know, available at to his him disposal. at his disposal yeah, okay. but um, Anyway, so it, it just took it just took longer, but the, we we got there, and um, and the album as taboo came out of that. Brilliant, excellent. Let's have a listen. This track is called uh, Critical Stroke Dance. Mm, interesting. Renato on the left end, of course, and that was uh, Critical Stroke Dance from their album uh, The Elbow Is Taboo. Uh, what's the story behind that title? You said you had a story behind oh, that the, one. The, the, yeah, well, that's, um, that's a song about uh, a a, a ballet teacher who's um, criticising uh, terminally inept students. Um, 
I have no idea where it came from. I mean, right. it's not like through experience, that's for sure. No. Um, but, uh, yeah, and uh, so the first part's the critical bit and the second part is the dance bit. OK, excellent. Right, OK, Brian, um, we'll be coming back after the news. We've got the news coming up now. Uh, thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Steve Vinyl Show on The Flash, two hours of classic punk and new wave every Thursday evening. And if you've just come in and remissed half of it, it's repeated again on Sunday evening uh, from 10 till midnight. OK, taking up to the news. Who's then? I uh, haven't played them for at least one show. Let's have a bit of the damn, shall we? Is she really going out with him? Steve Vinyl Show, two hours of classic punk and new wave every Thursday evening. And uh, again, repeated on Sunday, uh, if you uh, miss most of the show, from uh, 10 till uh, midnight. Uh, on the show tonight, I've got a guest, uh, Brian Paul, uh, one half of Renardo and The Loaf. And uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, their history and uh, their releases and playing some of their music. So uh, stay tuned for that. OK, let's start off with uh, a bit of the clash, I think. OK, uh... Brian, um, we're talking about Ronaldo and the Loaf, of course. Um, how would you describe your music? I mean, it's 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 a real mixture, isn't it? Well, really, we don't describe our music. Um, <laughs> it's it's not a cop out. Um, we we make music that we like. Yeah, to, uh, how it sounds. Uh, okay, there are certain references that you can pick out of out of some of our pieces that we've done mm. um, but we don't consciously go about it in that way no. so describing our music would um, hmm, let me see I, I, you have to ask other people how they describe it I mean, yeah. what, they, what it does for them but it's um, you know, people say oh it's weird and oh, weird is such a tired word it really is mm. I mean describing mm. something as weird yeah. it's like saying something's interesting um, it is what it is. Yeah. Our music is, I mean, it's Ronaldo and the Loaf music, and it's a, it's a bit of this, it's a bit of that. Mm. It has a, perhaps a bit of folk music in it. My, 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 nat, my singing voice is not a rock voice. It's, it's uh, more of a folk voice. Yeah. Uh, it has electronic stuff, but we, we created our own sort of vocabulary of what yeah. we do, like using loop tapes a lot right? Um, to create rhythms. And, and so... You know, a lot of the lot of the the sounds we use um, are not always predictable, uh, yeah. to, even to us. Uh, and we love the idea of um, being surprised by our own music. And ha and, and the the other thing I was going to ask, which leads nicely onto it. I mean, I mean, how do you write your music? I mean, I know I know now you you, you file share and you you mm -hmm. on the PC on the mm -hmm. internet. Mm -hmm. um, does one of you come up with an idea? I mean, do you come up with the lyrics from it or the music first, or how does that work? Usually the music comes first. Right. Um, and uh, the lyrics then get influenced by how the music feels. Right. Uh, I, I, basically, we, we, we just sort of do sketches. And, um, uh, and in the past it was like this. You know, Dave would make a, a loop tape up, for example. Right. Which would be... Uh, you know, influence, and we'd sit down and we'd just sort of improvise to it, and then something would happen, and that might sort of then distill into a song. Yeah. Um, now, of course, it's all computers. Uh, Dave doesn't play any uh, acoustic instruments at all. Right. He's completely electronic. Okay. Um, and has mastered uh, the software he uses. I mean, I can't fail to be impressed all the time with what he does. Right. Um, but uh, so. You know, there'd be there'd be a sort of a, a sketch, an idea, a, a rhythm, or something, and then I might sort of play some guitar or do some vocal on it, put a bit more electronics with it, send it back, and then we bounce it backwards and forwards okay. until we say it's done. Um, so we don't really write. We never have written music actually. Okay, because mm. the normal formula, isn't it? I mean, you have a, either an intro, mm. verse, mm. chorus, middle yeah. eight, chorus, verse. Mm. Yeah, there's. You know, there's quite a normal structure to a sort of, if you like, popular song. Yeah, and I understand that, mm. um, but we've never understood it, and we've never done it. <laughs> um, it was... Well, it's good, yeah, and that's where you get, that's where you get your, your style from, isn't it? The fact I, that I, it's, I, it's yeah. unpredictable, you never know what's going to come next, really. No, no, uh, I mean, it's like, what, what is important is that we allow, any, allow our creativity to be completely open but we do have a quality control on what we do. Yes. Uh, and that's really important. Because the um, other question, how much rubbish do you produce that you just think, that's bin, be one in that? 
Uh, oh, well, it's, it's happened. It's, well, it's got it to. has it's happened. Got to. It's got yeah, to, it's, it's every happened, band has it. <laughs> nowadays, of course, rubbish just gets written over and uh, or deleted as a file. Right. Uh, in in uh, the old days, we just record over it. But yeah. um, uh, I mean, it's like luckily, uh, for example, in the past, um, I kept a diary on cassette of what we were doing in the sort in the. Um, uh, 80s right uh, uh, from our sessions when we got together mm. and those were like works in progress and you can actually hear how the songs evolved um, and some of that stuff we actually put out on uh, bonus discs with our um, double pack CD releases on Clan Gallery oh, okay. and that was great that we actually had those things mm. Um, mm. And, uh, and it was interesting for us to go back and listen to what we did then right right mm. okay uh, so uh, let's have a listen to the next track. Uh, this track is called Mouldy Bread on Bent Street. So yeah. tell me about that. OK, well, this, this is actually a recording from 2016. OK, so we've we jumped a number of years from mm. the last release. I mean, after Elbow uh, came out, um, I think it'd been such a different working pattern with Elbow, as I mentioned, that we, 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 we ran out of steam, basically. Right, right. We... Uh, I think I think we were basically just walking different paths, yeah, and and that's what we did. Mm. And we walked these paths in our lives, and eventually those paths came and met again in two thousand and six. Right. Uh, and thanks to the internet, we got back together, and. Um, um, so you were still chatting, you were still friends, but but the actual band wasn't functioning, the duo. Well, the, the band wasn't 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 functioning. In fact, no. we, we 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 both um, sort of scooted off into into our lives, okay. if you like. I mean, yeah. we've been working together for eighteen years. Yeah, at yeah. that point. Yeah, and I think we I think both of us needed a rest from each other. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> fair enough. But, uh, um, but uh, no, that was fine, and we we came back together. And we start just messing about a bit with music, nothing serious. Mm. Eventually, we tied up with uh, Walter Robotka at Clang Gallery, um, who was interested to re-release our back catalogue. Mm. And uh, we said we'd do expanded versions, and that got us really rolling. And uh, one of the things we did um, in that... Uh, that time was to create Mouldy Bread on Bent Street, which is about two characters from two songs on Elbow is Taboo, and it's a sort of a linkage back to the past. Right. Uh, that for the Bread song, which is on Elbow is Taboo, and another one called Street Called Straight, and the characters are those, what were they doing sort of like 35, 36 years later? And okay. so that, this song was written about it. The Bread's Gone Mouldy. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Street Called Straight is now very, very crooked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's have a listen then. This is a Renato on the Loaf, and this is Mouldy Bread on Bent Street. Uh, the songwriting process. Um, the other thing that fascinates me is the instruments and the sounds that you get on those songs. So, mm -hmm. I mean, do you have a room full of these instruments and you go in there and you just pick a few? I mean, what have you got? You must, uh, have, must have hundreds, surely. <laughs> yeah, it's fair to say that I've got a room full of stuff. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff there. But, I mean, if we go back to when we were just, you know, say, 77, something like that, Yeah. we, we had electric guitars, acoustic, acoustic guitars, some, some outboard devices, you know, a copycat echo unit, stuff like that, a couple yep. of tape recorders. Right. Um, but we used... we, we basically couldn't afford synthesizers like that, like a hissy mm. sound on the old um, analog sort of synth. Um, we, well, we didn't have one, so a MIDI um, control unit like a clarinet. Um, I, I think he has, he has an acoustic guitar, but he doesn't really use it. Right. Um, but Dave creates music you know, um, with a piece of software and sampling. Okay. Uh, my room is full of uh, of junk. Um, so you're um, the hands-on person. You've got you've got, uh, well, I've the, got the wooden guitars, instruments. I've got the wooden instruments. Yeah, I've got guitars, yeah. bazookas, mandolins, a couple of Chinese instruments, um, uh, and various things like, as well as the computer software mm. to do stuff and keyboards and all that stuff. Um, so it, it 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 sort of all just gets mashed together. 
Yeah. Uh, and if it needs an acoustic instrument, it has one. Mm. Um, and uh, I have that stuff at my disposal and, and um, percussion pieces as well. Okay, okay. So you've got all this stuff, okay. Mm. I mean, how long does it take you to write a song? Well, it can be from being, it could be perhaps something as short as a couple of weeks for us to complete the piece. Okay. To two years plus. Wow. Um, I mean, example, like the next song you're going to play, Pessimistic Song from uh, Gertie Herding. Uh, that, I, I think, was two years from the first bit of recording to when it was finished. Okay. Um, because when it was first bits were recorded, like bazookies and something or other, you know, it, it, it wasn't meant to be a song. We had no album. We weren't actually working towards anything. We were so just doing... So there was doing no pressure. You no pressure. And so it was there and a little bit was done to it. And then eventually when we getting songs together, um, it was completed. Um, I mean, like Gertie Herding itself, I mean, it wasn't ever, say, meant to be an album until we, about a year before it came out, we played some songs to, to Walter at Clang Gallery, and he really liked them, and he says, guys, you got, you know, you, you could do an album. And right. so we, that's what happened. So, 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 pessimistic song, mm -hmm. about two years in the making. Yeah. And the album, uh, Herdy... Ger Gerdy Herdy. Gerdy Herdy. Yeah, I keep saying that. No, I, I keep wanting to say Ger Herdy Gerdy, as in Donovan. <laughs> it's like a tongue twister. Gerdy Herding. I mean, that album, I mean, how many tracks is on that album? Oh, you've asked me, you've got, you've got a copy over oh, there. Oh, yeah, you can have yeah. A look. I, I can't remember, 13, 14, I don't know. Okay, okay. So, yeah. how long did it get to get the album together then? I think seriously, it probably got it got took a couple of years, right? Um, you know, to 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 actually create all those tracks. When you when you figure you're actually working towards a particular project, it accelerates. And, yes, um, of course, of course. Uh, so um, we didn't tell anybody that we were doing it. I mean, they, our our, uh, our fans knew nothing about it until we just announced it. Yeah. Um, you got thirteen. Yeah, I've just I just got the CD. Thirteen tracks on there. Oh, a good guess, eh? <laughs> yeah. Um, so so yeah, we did a video with a um, a good friend of ours, uh, Jess Stevens, uh, based in Portsmouth. He directed a video for us, which we filmed in Wales. Right. And it's for one of the songs, uh, a convivial ode. It's on um, it's on YouTube and that. And uh, okay. it's where we we dressed up in. Uh, strange costumes and it's very medieval isn't it i'm looking at yeah. the front cover here now mm -hmm. i know our listeners just can't can't see it but uh, it, it's got a medieval feel about it hasn't yeah, it yeah the, the, the album's the got sort of a medieval vibe and it's uh, the the, I mean, the 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 clothing well that that um the image on the front of the cd and the front of the album is was uh, devised by um uh, an artist in the states called poxod who's a very talented lady who who did this artwork for us? She made the hats we wear in the video, um, and uh, you know the styling really came largely from her. Okay. Um, and how did you get get to meet her then? Oh, well, Pox, I'd say uh, a big residence fan as oh, well as right. well as okay. an Alan fan, and via the the, the, the a residence chat group, I, I knew of her. I looked at her art online. Um, showed it to Dave. Dave really liked it, and mm. so we contacted and said, "Hey, do you want to do? Do you want to do our cover?" Okay, brilliant, so, brilliant. But, so it has a medieval vibe. That's right. And it's um, the strange thing is that at the point we were just deciding to have this very long break, uh, we were in, sitting in a pub just having a chat. This is back in '87, uh, saying, "Well, what could we possibly look at next if we wanted to?" Mm. And we thought, "What would happen if Ronaldo and the Loaf?" collided with medieval music right and because we were listening to early music at the time and that sort of thing and uh, that's where it was left but we, we realized it all these years later brilliant brilliant okay let's have a listen to it this is a uh, pessimistic song from uh, gerdy hurtling <laughs> okay uh before uh that we were talking uh, about the band and we we're talking <coughs> about the instruments um Playing live, Brian. Now, I, I can imagine this is quite a tall order considering how you two work, but I know that you've actually done two gigs in your lifetime. Is that correct? With yeah. Renato and the Low. So yeah. the first gig 
was the South Pacific album, mm -hmm. which came out in 1980. Well, it was the showcase to sort of promo. It, it. was the launch party, wasn't it? Well, no, it wasn't really, because yeah, that was the live. The live shows were in April, right. but the album didn't come out till August. Um, okay, it was. I don't know. It just. It just was. I mean, it was. It was. It happened, and it was like bands from South Pacific playing and that was the carno in portsmouth yeah the bally high suite yeah and how did you so it was just two of you on stage yeah well look we we we, we figured that we had no in, we had no designs on playing live but right we, we were asked really nicely would we like do it we said oh, okay and we knew we couldn't actually translate our songs at all on a stage right um and so we said we thought well we do an improvisation because some of our songs actually were born out of improvisations right so we set up a, a tape delay system on the stage using two tape recorders slinging a tape between them yep. giving a long delay echo and and we played for about 18 minutes um improvising right and uh it went all right, I think. Um, it was certainly different. We were first on. Uh, we had no sound check. We had virtually no time to set up properly, but we just did it. Right. Um, but I don't consider that as being like a show or anything. But no. the second time we played, it was um, really well considered, and it was more like a proper show. So the first one was in 1980. Yeah. And then the second gig you did mm. was in Vienna yeah. in, nine, in 2016. No, 2018. Oh, 2018. 38 years later, yeah. So how did you end up in Vienna from Locarno in Portsmouth? <laughs> OK. Vienna is, the, is where our record label that we work with is based. OK. Clang Gallery is, is, is in Vienna. Ah, and right. It was that's the, the connection. That's the connection. It was the 25th anniversary of the label Clang Gallery. And Walter, uh, who is the boss of Clang Gallery, he asked... He'd asked us before, and logistically it was just too difficult and it didn't happen. And he just said, any chance you could come and do something? Mm. And after a bit of thought, we said, yeah. And um, it took six months to put together. Right. Uh, and we went and did it. And the, the show had... Um, Re, re, um, revisited versions of our old songs. Okay. Um, and also, each song had a video made for it. My. Um By Poxod and Jez Stevens. Um, they did a great job. My. And so, there's just the two of us on stage. Nowadays, of course, you can have a laptop playing a backing. Yes. Nobody worries about that. No. So, we had that. Dave played live um, MIDI clarinet. I sang. Um, and, and there was the video, and um, we had a great time, and the audience was brilliant. So that was a better sound, you had a sound check, it was a proper oh, show. Oh, yeah, that was really done properly. Yeah, 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 you yeah. had monitoring and everything, everything was, everything was and done did really you, well. And did you enjoy it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we had a great time. Um, you know, we didn't know what to expect. Um, I managed to get through, through, I never sung for an hour, ever. Um, right. You know, doing it one song after another, mm. but managed, and um, yeah, we had we had a great time. And as I say, the audience just were uh, really appreciative, and we had apparently we had people that came from uh, the states to come and see it. Wow! Uh, another guy from Canada, people from Scandinavia, various other parts of so Europe. So these are your fans from yeah. across the world. Yeah, because we'd never played live before, and there was no guarantees at all that we would do it ever again. My, which is how this how it is now i mean you know and vienna i mean you know what a great location oh vienna's great yeah i love it yeah and yeah. i mean yeah so that was all expenses paid then i mean yeah. wow amazing yeah. Yeah. so uh, the obvious question i'm going to ask now of course mm. you've got the south pacific 40 anniversary are you going to play on their launch <laughs> well nobody's asked yet except, well, except you um <laughs> uh, I, really it's we're, we're, we want to devote our energies, really, more to actually doing new material and getting some more recordings done. Right. Because if we were to actually do anything live, um, uh, it will take quite a bit of preparation for us to do it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I should certainly be there. Um, whether David wants to come over to be at the launch thing as well, mm, mm. Um, that, that's great. Um, and, uh, we, you know... We're looking forward to the album happening. 
But you don't think you'll be playing live again, ever again? Oh, we've never said never. Oh, OK. We've never said never, but it's right. just not something which is really on our radar. OK, that's fine. OK, so the next tracks are so it leads us nicely into... Because you actually recorded the live in Vienna, didn't you? you actually it was recorded, recorded the off the desk, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the tracks I've got here are Sprat's Medium, mm -hmm. followed by Medical Man. Yeah. So let's have a listen to those uh, tracks. So this is live uh, from that particular gig we were talking about. OK, uh, Renato on the loaf still in the house, uh, Brian. And uh, what we're going to talk about now, Brian, uh, what's the next track we're going to play? Uh, well, the last track we uh, brought is um, is Hambu Hodo. Right. Um, it's the seven inch. Um, well, seven. It means it's an edit, which would fit on a seven inch single. Okay. Um, it's actually a track that was on Elbow Is Taboo and a twelve inch single version at the time. And um, this is an edit that we uh, we did, and uh, it was never released as this until recently. Um, Hambu Hodo. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, it's about um, seeing a, a fast food wagon. I saw a fast food wagon on the, on the street and the, the letters had fallen off the side of it. Um, and it was hamburgers and hot dogs and it said Hambu Hodo. And so, oh, sort of it, thought, um, and so we thought that's, that's a good idea for putting some lyrics. So the lyrics are actually made up of all book titles that Dave had on his um, shelf with letters dropped out. <laughs> so it, one was Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and it's Ziani Ara Moto. <laughs> and that's what all the lyrics are about. Excellent. OK, let's have a listen to that. This, so this is <laughs> Hambu Hodo. Oh, no. <laughs> hey! OK, uh, thanks very much uh, for coming in uh, tonight, Brian, and talking about Renato Olof and playing their music. Oh, it's a pleasure. No, I'm very, very happy to do so, and thanks for... Um, getting a chance to actually play some of this stuff. Mm. Um, anyway, before I go, I've got to say, Tom Eric in Norway, sorry, no time for any lungfish. OK, sorry, mate. <laughs> and um, Mouldy Bread was 2016, not 2006. OK, thank you. OK, then. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. Steve Barlow, uh, show. Uh, I'll, uh, don't forget, it's repeated again on Sunday night from 10 uh, till midnight. See you next Thursday.